Son, don't go to sleep while I'm talking. Hey, 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 don't, don't, don't you lay your head back. I, I'm, I'm important. I'm somebody. Now, you might do your English teacher that way, but I'm not teaching English. I'm teaching eternal life here. I love you. You know I love you. Have I convinced you I love you? Uh, yeah, you better, th- you better nod your head yes. All right, come on, put it right there. All right, you stay awake and you listen to me. You say, well, he may never come back. Well, he ain't here now. And where have you been, Mr. Underwood? And I noticed on the calendar I'm supposed to marry y'all. What makes you think I'd marry you? You're one of the sorriest church members I have. You're not worth 15 cents. And you want me to marry you to her? And you want to marry him? And he don't even know where he belongs? And you don't even know where you belong? Now, uh, let me tell you all, everybody here, how much I love these kids. Do you know I love you, sir? Stand up, big boy. Do you know I love you? Mm-hmm. All right. All right. Give me a little love. Mm-hmm. I'm a real deal. Yeah. All right. I know you are too, but you ain't been here. You can't get this in any other church in town. Now, y'all don't want me. All you got to do is tell me we won't have a church fight because I'll get my little Connie and we'll get in her little Buick Enclave. It's paid for. And. We'll sell what we need to sell, and we'll go on down the road, and we'll find some little podunk church that don't know up from down, and I'll find me a dozen Joe's baskets who don't have a pot or a window and who will shout Jesus, and I'll give the rest of my life to them. But I'm not interested in recreating the prostitute of the church. Amen. Amen. You remember when I came here, Kelly? You remember... Where your wife was, where your sisters were, do you remember where they were? And we made holy war, do you remember that? Stay with me, don't quit me. Oh, Brandy, oh, Brandy's a sweet girl and she's got her children. Yes, y'all are good and y'all are fine, but your children will turn on you if you don't hold up the standard and the banner of God. And if they don't turn on you, they'll just, you'll just produce nice little whirlians. Are y'all keeping the camera on me back there in the little video room? Good. We're having trouble in the video room. There's no one finer than young Cox back there. And he comes down here and spends hours in that thing. But he has a little attitude adjustment that we're going to fix. Brother Cox, you listening? Because, Brother Cox, I can fix your ju- attitude adjustment. And I don't care what your mama thinks and your daddy thinks. And I don't have a better friend than your mama. But mama, you get out of my way when I'm messing with that boy because I'm his preacher. I'm, I'm yours when I'm talking to you. But I'm his when I'm talking to him. And last I checked, he's a grown man. And that video room ain't going to be a youth hangout. We might as well just fix this thing. And I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Well, if you don't know what you're doing wrong, son, you don't care about what I want to do right. Because if you loved me and you submitted to me, you'd know what my heart is and my message is. And you wouldn't go about establishing your own kingdom in the video room. I really feel good now. Jesus. Jesus. You gotta love that head nod at the end. <laughs> this is Chief Yuya. Welcome to the Chief Yuya pad- podcast. I'm um, sharing uh, this, the uh, platform on this day with uh, Pastor Jim Stanridge. 
That's who you just heard. Presbyterian past, pastor outside of uh, uh, Oklahoma, somewhere, somewhere down there in Oklahoma. He's been servicing that particular congregation for about 24 years. And um, yeah, so we're here, we're here, we're here. And, um, you know, there's so many things to, to speak about. And um, there's so many things from that clip. You know, uh, it's very interesting how individuals who listened to it or, or watched it, rather, for those, some of you may have seen it already, or for those of you who just saw it on YouTube, oh, looking for me already. There they go, as soon as I get started. But um, either way, uh, turn my ring off. <laughs> yeah, for some of you may have seen it, you know, there's been a lot of interesting comments, you know, and like I, I've often said, when it comes to leadership, usually those who are not in leadership and who don't even contribute <laughs> to the work that leadership is doing are usually the ones that have the most to say. And of course, those are typically your internet trolls. You know, they've never led anything, built anything, covered anything, helped anyone, but they always um, want to tell leaders how they're supposed to do their job even though they were not even called to leadership themselves and don't have the skill set or the acuteness, um, or um, excuse me, the, the acumen to actually serve in those positions. So, you know, some of the, the comments were very interesting in terms of what people were saying, but, you know, as being a coordinator, I can relate to a lot of, uh, you know, obviously what, what he was sharing and um, definitely can relate to the support you heard people, you know, kind of cheering him on in a, in a sense towards the end. And that's necessary sometimes. You know, when you take the leadership mantle, there's a lot of self-validation that has to happen. And a lot of times you'll do things that people will say you're crazy to do or they won't really understand the nature of what drives you towards a certain mission. And... um Maybe even sometimes the disappointment that you may have, you know, because people perceive what you're doing as something else. You know, like one of the things that um, Mr. Stanrich had said was that uh, in response, you know, like when he was questioned by media and stuff and, you know, commenting on the comments, he said, I could care less about. I mean, it's a 76 year old man, so he's probably not as, um, you know, not as, as entwined and invested in what social media is talking about. Um, you know, so one of the things he said was that this was a family meeting. This was not a national meeting. So what would I care about <laughs> what a few strangers have to say on the internet, which is, which is on point. And you know, there's so many different places that you can learn from if you just know how to sift through things. You know, uh, of course, there's some environments once you get to a certain place in your development and in your learning, there's certain environments that you just would think that you are not going to learn anything from, <laughs> you know, and uh, a church down in, you know, a Presbyterian church in Oklahoma, you know, um, you know, you might think, well, there's nothing there for me, you know, and um, that could be the, that could be the case some days, you know, but uh, if you have ears to hear, you'll always recognize that um, there's always something in every moment and in every environment, there's always something to gather, you know, and where some people just kind of classified that experience um, and just kind of said that he was just, he was abusing uh, the congregation. Many people were saying that uh, he just threw a, a hissy fit, you know, um, because they didn't, they can't really understand what's happening. You know, um, they would, people were talking about how he was mocking the church members and things like that. And again, um, you'd be surprised what people don't see. You can sometimes observe that if you look at some of the videos and podcasts I put up and look at the responses sometimes. You know, I did a, a segment recently speaking about the coronavirus and Kobe Bryant and, 
you know, really the segment was about avoiding idolatry, where you're worshiping celebrities. And through your worship of celebrities, you, you end up overlooking the plagues and the destruction that's coming as a result of the judgment that you're facing for worshiping idols. Now you go and look at the responses <laughs> and you know, you, you, you might see something different because some things just go over people's heads. Sometimes people just don't get what's being said, or sometimes they just um, maybe have a personal statement that they want to make about a certain thing. And they kind of just, they're fixated on what it is that they want to say, you know, there's all, all different reasons why maybe someone may not be able to, um, or, or may not be willing uh, to follow a, a certain frequency of thought that's being shared. But um, yeah, in any event, you know, you, you'll pick up different things. And obviously if you find yourself in, um, uh, actually it was a Baptist church, right? Cause it's Emmanuel Baptist church. I kept saying Presbyterian. Um, but I don't think it would be a Presbyterian church and the place is called Emmanuel Baptist. Just kind of, kind of, you know, I just remember. But, um, anyway, like I was saying, you know, um, sometimes it's very difficult to, to see certain things if you're just distracted. And a lot of times that can be the frustration of the pastor, preacher, teacher, whatever, you know, um, because sometimes as a leader or as a teacher, you can be distracted with the wrong agenda, right? So <laughs> he's in church and he's preaching and, you know, I guess it sparked off because somebody was falling asleep. And I'm going to tell you, you know, this, this message is primarily for those leaders in leadership and on new discipleship. So a lot of you may listen to this and not really, you may not get it you know, um, or may not care. <laughs> it's fine either way, you know, but the thing is sometimes, sometimes your, your message is old, your message is old and you, you don't know how to connect with people because, um, you know, it's just like if you've ever been to an elderly person's domicile, one of the things that you, you, you'll notice is, how many things that they do or have that go unnoticed. You know, um, there could be old stuff in the corner, old stuff on the bookshelves, things that are just out of order. You know, curtains are, are dusty or, you know, they're held up by clothespin. And you need, but after a while, you just become used to it. You know, and, and it's the same thing. Sometimes you go into certain environments. It could be a hotel. It could be a restaurant. And things have been kept a certain way for so long that people just don't see it anymore. They don't really truly see um, the impression that other people's have, other, that the environment gives to other people. And of course, first impressions are very important, right? So a lot of times when you're trying to share information with people, whether it be family and friends or you're in a leadership position and people are just not really grasping to, you know, grasping what it is that you're sharing. A lot of times it's because your the environment that you're establishing for sharing is just not, it's not, it's not inviting. You know, it's not accommodating on any level of what people need to feel. And it may not even be comfortable. You see, it, it may not even be comfortable. And sometimes that's things you got to look at. And um, this individual, he's 76, he's been serving that church for 24 years. So, and, and again, I, I've never been to that church. I'm not going to go to that church. <laughs> you know, um, only time I find myself inside of church buildings, usually at this stage of my life, is if I'm um, speaking at a funeral. You know, but um, nonetheless, um, he, he there may be certain things in that environment that he's not seen at this point. Could be. Or... It was just time for him to chastise the congregation. And as a leader, as a pastor, you're like a father. You're a shepherd to the congregation. And, you know, you're, in, you're well within your rights to cast judgment. 
people always say, you know, you shouldn't judge, you shouldn't judge. They don't, people don't know how to read things in context. It's okay to judge, especially when your leaders, you know, there's certain people who are put here for enforcement of codes and enforcement of laws and statutes. And again, if you have a pastor, someone, um, when they're ordinated, ordained, um, they're charged with your blood. <laughs> they're charged with the blood and the oaths of the congregation. So if you're playing around or you're not respecting the experience, you know, you can't always expect everything to come at you so meek and humbly because that's, that's a part of the social programming. You know, even like in that Christian paradigm, um, they always present this image of Jesus the Christ as like just very soft and very effeminate, you know, the long hair and, and, and all that. And, and, and the lined up beard, <laughs> you know, and he just looks so soft and so, so humble and so meek. And Yeshua HaMashiach was not that. Yeshua HaMashiach was a warrior, you know, um, but that's the depiction that they provide. So then when now people start to assimilate themselves with the representation of spiritual leadership or seek to assimilate themselves with it, they begin to assimilate themselves in a very effeminate and soft way if they're men. But, but what you'll find interesting enough is that the female preachers and evangelists, they do the opposite. They often a lot of times present themselves as very manly. You know, um, ooh, drop my phone. So, um, you know, sometimes when people or leaders have to speak up as they are completely entitled to do, um, people, they, they begin to hold them to an erroneous standard, you know, and you'll find that was interesting a lot of times. Um, and again, like I said, this is leaders will understand this or any of you who are teachers or if you have elays and you have God children on you, you know, um, you'll find that people will constantly want to hold you to a standard that they have no intention of holding themselves to whatsoever. Not, not even to, to the smallest degree. I've had students before attempt to curse me out, go off on me and all kind of things. And, you know, if I say anything in response, they will capitalize on the response instead of taking the moment and the opportunity to be repentant for how they came at me as leadership. That's just swept under the rug. Nobody cares. You know, you told me I need to shut my mouth. You told me if I say one more word to you like that, you're going to hang up the phone and, you know, or whatever else. Or you might have told me to shut the F up, depending on what the situation was. You know, and it's and it's really um, it's it's really indicative of where people are a lot of times when there's moments where leaders are kind of giving their all. In a sense, they just sit back. They sit back and they wait and they they wait and they watch. You know, and this is similar to what I spoke about in Blood Family. You know, they wait and they watch for you to fall, so then they can they can cast judgments on the fall, and they don't realize that as leaders, as true leaders, you know. You have a, a lot of patience, but you have a lot of foresight and you have a lot of self-control. So a lot of times when people think like he wasn't going off, people are like, oh, he threw a hissy fit. No, he didn't. I, I'm, I'm watching. I can see how controlled it was. He was pausing. He was making sure that people, everyone who he was talking to, he was making sure he was connecting with them. He wasn't just saying, you're a piece of crap, yada, yada, and I get lost. You know, he's giving people's handshakes, hugs. He's letting them know, I'm saying this to you because I love you. Not because I'm, I'm just here to rebuke you, but I, I need to let you know that what you're doing is not cool. And you, you maybe need to hear it in a way so that, that you'll wake up to it. Because sometimes when your behavior is very common, someone needs to speak to you in a common way for you to actually listen. When your behavior is very low vibrational and low based and common and someone seeks to speak to you in a regal way, a lot of times it just goes over your head and you don't hear it. And to someone for a moment dips down and speaks in a frequency that you can understand. Now, if you have humility in you, then you'll say, OK, oh, I'm sorry. Let me 
yeah, let me get it together because you're respecting the leadership that's in front of you. But if you're saturated with your own delusional ego, then now you see, okay, I got to fight on my We're going to fight now without realizing that typically when leadership is doing that, they're not challenging you and you're not a challenge to them. They're just working out different angles to communicate with you because nothing else has worked. You've been completely unresponsive to everything else. So now let's try this. And then there might be other things they could try before they excommunicate you and just say, you know what? Get out. Because obviously, you know, um, you don't respect the leadership here. You don't respect the mission. And like he said, if you would just submit to me, because that's what you're supposed to do anyway. But see, that's part of the problem when you're in those, those environments like the Christian environments and real change isn't really demanded. You know, it's just you come as you are and, and, and there's this, this strong spirit of grace a lot of times. And there's always a, a, a what you could call like a casualty. That's my, my phone. So my phone's ringing a lot now all of a sudden. You know, um, <laughs> but there's always like this really, um, there's a casualty when, you know, your entire ministry or your entire service is based around grace. You find out a lot in the culture communities, you know, no one really seeks to correct anyone because everyone's a part of the culture community because they wanted to escape the correction of organized institutions or the binding, the religious binding of organized institutions. And, and you know, there's like a there's a there's a there's an interesting contrast there, because in a lot of environments, like a lot of them church environments it's like, you know, um, they design the church environment primarily for people who are quote unquote saved, you know, um, and primarily people who are saved and act like they're saved. See, that's the key. Like you can't be saved and express a different flavor or a different, you know, or an authentic flavor of what it looks like. So that's why when you go into a lot of those church environments, whatever they dictate as the saved, you know, um, energy and spirit to be, you got to fall into that. That's why you notice it's, it's very unisexual. Everybody acts like females, especially in, in, in the Negro church environment. Um, they all praise the same. Everybody's trying to hit a high note. <laughs> you know, no one's trying to hit a low note. The men are not trying to see how low they could sing. That, that would kind of make sense. Um, the women are trying to hit the highest note they can. And the men are trying to hit the highest note they can. Um, the choir director's up there, you know, he's a flamer, <laughs> you know. And, um, you know, when pe people are falling out in the spirit, like little girls, you know, male or female, doesn't matter. Everybody is praising the same way, singing the same way. Then when they go to shout, you know, or like they say down south, get happy. Everybody shouting the same, same, the same, uh, I can't even call it a two-step, the same three-step. <laughs> You know, so it's this there's this model that's put forward and it's it says that we all have to kind of um you know follow this motif of whoever the person was that decided what acting like you're saved looks like. And and the truth is environments that are designed for people to who who we would call saved or who are conscious or who are woke whatever it is, those are environments that are, that are primarily designed uh, to be filled up with hypocrites. You see, that's, that's, the, that's the danger of that, you know, because you're, you're, you're covering up so much. Um, and you may cover something up to kind of keep someone in good standing with your organization or with your church or with your movement, but... Um, you know, at the same time, what happens is that it only fuels whatever that person is covering up. You see, the, the more you hide it, the stronger you make it. Just like a spirit, just like a vampire. The more you keep it in out of the sunlight and keep it in the shadows, the stronger it's going to get. You see, so there's, there's like a, a catch-22 in many senses. And, you know, the casualty in an environment a woke environment built for woke people 
or a church environment built built for churchified people is is grace. So you can't really offer grace to individuals who don't appear to need grace. And it's hard to admit that you need grace when you're not positive that you're going to receive it in that environment. So you can't really have, you know, honesty. You can't really have authenticity. So there's a there's a sacrifice that happens there when um, you're trying to maintain a certain aesthetic in your environment. Just like me, you know, people say a lot of times, you know, um, sometimes they like to make certain criticisms in terms of how I should behave. They never they never make it to my face. It's it's like always a comment or something like that. Which I'm kind of like Jim Standridge. I don't care. I don't know you. I don't I don't care about what you have to say. And anybody that I know that I respect doesn't even criticize people like that. I receive critical feedback from people I respect, but you know, in all things there's you know how to how to uh deport yourself with with you know some level of grace and decorum. You know, you know, like just plain old manners, you know, and some people just don't have manners at all. And highly enlightened people are mannerable. You know, that's that just it, it comes along with the package, you know, <laughs> it comes along with the package of, of being, quote unquote, woke, you know. But, you know, like so you have different kind of kind of things there. But on the other side of that spectrum, like you have the grace aspect and you have the truth aspect. Right. And I knew see, I knew is a ministry of grace and truth. And this is what I'm explaining in this particular segment. Um. So there's grace in that there's an, there's an understanding that, um, you know, we all have things that we need to put on the table and we all have experiences that um, that maybe base some of the, the nuances and the, and, the, and the answers that we may give. And it, and it may make some of us uncomfortable to some degree because we might have messiness um, or we, we end up being, uh, in our minds, poor representations of the very energies that, or the very forces that we're seeking to become like. And um, what happens is when we're not honest about that, we begin to argue with one another over what the depiction of a true movement is supposed to look like, or what the de- depiction of a true temple is supposed, to, is supposed to look like. And then we end up standing on opposite sides of something that we really never needed to, right? So... You have the other aspect of truth, and that's that's really the tough one because, um, of course, you want to be open, uh, you want to value openness, and you want to have a measure of tolerance and acceptance, and you know, um, you want to be able to allow people to declare what it is that they they're struggling with, if they're really struggling. So there's a difference between someone saying, you know, um, I don't know, I I I I. Uh, I mean, you just pick pick something mean to do, you know. Um, I I kick homeless people in the butt when they when they're picking up you know bottles and cans, or someone saying I struggle with abusing homeless people when they're picking up bottles and cans. You know, you know there's a difference there. So you you don't sometimes when people come through the door, this is another this is a trick when they come through the door and they say, hey, you know, I want to be in an environment where I could be myself, or I want to be in an environment where I can express myself and don't feel like I'm going to be judged. You're going to get judged. Judge, you're supposed to be judged. What do you think this is? <laughs> you're coming into this environment so that you can become a better person, but you you want to be exactly who you are, and you don't want anybody to say anything. That's that's that sickness, you see, and that's that sickness, and that's that slickness. You know, you have to come into an environment, whether it's a spiritual environment, learning environment. You have to come into it like a child. And be ready to be taught and be ready to be guided and instructed like you are a child, right? Um, but but you can, at least for our new, you know that there's grace. It's like when you're paying your bills, there's grace period, right? And via that grace, is like, okay, you're given some time to receive the instruction and get yourself together. You know, but that doesn't mean that you you receive. It's almost like when you post a 10-point plan, right? You know how many times I've had people tell me, oh, you should post a 10-point plan for Anu on the website, on Anu Life Global, so like when people come, they they kind of see what, you, what your plan is. No, 
And I've always said, no. Even in meetings that I've had, when people have been like, okay, well, what's the 10-point plan? I'll, I'll give a cursory idea. If you're an outside, I'm not giving you that. Because all you're going to do, this, this is how infiltrations happen. Now you just got to figure out a way to counteract my 10-point plan. You see? If I said, well, we want freedom. Well, then now you'll figure out a way to give me the illusion of freedom. We want justice. <laughs> You'll, you'll now start telling me that, well, in order to receive justice, you got to be a part of the system. How are you going to be a part of, of the solution if you're not inside of the mechanisms that would actually provide the, the solution? Come on now. We want land. Okay, well, we could, we could play that game too. You know, we, we, can, we can wrap you up in red tape and bureaucracy um, with the promise of, of free land, 40 acres and a, mule, and a mule. We know how that one goes, right? So you'll find that there's so many opportunities where people can um, kind of counteract whatever it is that you put forth. You know, but there's, there's, a, there's a slickness in getting around things, but then there's also a genuine and authentic desire for people who declare that they want to um, refine certain beliefs or refine certain behaviors. And, you know, you give them that space and you give them that instruction and that guidance where they could do that. So on the other side, like I said, our new Life Global Ministries, we're a grace and truth ministry, where, where the truth becomes the important piece. Because when you become too open and too cool <laughs> and too liberal, right, with everything, then what you have to end up doing is you have to kill off the truth. The truth becomes like your first um, victim of carnage. You know, so whereas you, when, you're, when you're too um, hypocritical, you end up sacrificing grace, right? And when you're too open and too accepting of everything, then you end up having to sacrifice truth, you know? And because people hate, like, they like to use terms like, well, my truth or your truth. Let's say your truth. I had a female say that to me once when she was saying something silly. And I was like, wait a minute, you're not listening. I'm trying to tell you something. She's like, okay, okay, let's hear your truth. I hung up on that mm. right there on the spot, hung up on her. And I was like, yo, don't, don't ever call me again. You know exactly. I said, first of all, you never laugh at a man, never giggle or laugh at a man. Never, ever, ever, ever. And, and females pick up these, pick up these gems that I'm putting down. Don't think this is a tangent. Never laugh at a man. Don't even giggle. Don't do it. And don't sit here and say, what you, what you see? I, I can't laugh. Don't, don't even try to play around with it and don't do it. Right? You don't want a man knocking your teeth out, right? That's something that should never happen. And there's no justification for it. You shouldn't be able to say, well, come on. Well, well I can't knock a little tooth out. Come on. I can't knock a little toothy tooth out. Right? It's the same thing. Don't laugh at a man. And then when you say things like, well, let me hear your truth. Now you're reducing his instruction to, a, to opinion that you could take or leave. Very disrespectful. There's nothing left after that. Nothing left. So, you know, in that instance, people have a lot of times trouble with the absolutism of truth. When you say truth, it's just by, by itself, nothing else. Your truth, my truth, uh, God's truth, man's truth. No, truth. It stands in absolutism, and people really can be increasingly uneasy <laughs> about, about the, uh, the tone and the idea that there are absolute truths. Yeah. You start talking, and people say, well, that's your interpretation. That's your opinion. Yeah. That's why you stay cursed. That's exactly why you stay cursed. You see, that's why we can live in a society where all forms of perversions are are denoted as, as progress, you see. And people refuse to see the idea and see the plan, you see. They don't even understand how all this unisexualization of, of, of the world's populace, and let's just say the, of the American populace, is so that they can easily and quickly later get you into citizen work camps. You don't even see it. You think it's progress, you see. We get the men and, men and the women to do the same job now, we, 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 it's so much easier now to put them in concentration camps or, excuse me, work camps, citizen work camps. 
You see, because we're moving into a place we're, we're moving into not only a cashless society, but a currency less society. Money is not going to be so much of the thing anymore with so much automation. So the greatest resources will be the actual people. Not what the people can do, but the actual people. Mark my words. Because this thing is moving fast. Mark my words. You see. So this whole idea of unisexualizing, you know, read the book 1984 or even um, uh, uh, Brave New World. It's another great one. You could even watch the, I think 1984 had a movie. Or was it Brave New World? No, 1984. There was a movie, you know. But if you look at any dystopian film, you know, um, THX 1138, um, um, 33 Degrees Fahrenheit, you know, um, just look at any of them. What you're going to see is that there's, in, in those society, even Logan's run, but in those society, you, you will see there's, there's not a whole lot of distinction between male and female. You see? There's a reason for that. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> so, you know, there, there is a right way to do things and there's a wrong way to do things, but... Of course, most people don't want to be wrong. I've had so many clients and students say, I don't like to be wrong. I don't want to be wrong. I don't like being wrong. Something wrong with you then. That's what's wrong with you. You don't like being wrong. How are you ever going to get to what's right if you're not willing to go through what's wrong? You, you just, you're just a perfect being. You know, you don't, even, you don't need to be on the planet anymore. You're taking up space. If you're done now, you've reached perfection. You know, um, but the idea there is that you know, especially in a spiritual environment or on a, on a ministerial um, environment, that uh, we 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 need to rebirth. It's not about okay, I made a mistake and 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 hey, I'm just coming to you for some correction. It's not about that. It's about that I am persistently transgressing against the calibration of the Creator. And the character development that you're offering, maybe I'm not, you know, I'm not ingesting at the level that I should. I should, so I need to be rebirthed. Not just I need a second chance. See, that's that's what you have in those Christian environments, in those church environments. You know, they're about we're going to correct this and we're going to give you a second chance and stuff. No, no, no. But the real ones, it's like no, you got to be born again. I mean, that's that's what was said to Nicodemus. You got to be born again. Because that that's how you're uh, that's how you're saved, right? We use that term "saved" earlier. I'll use it again. Um, so there's a, there's the idea of, again of of grace and truth, you know, and that's a movement of law. You see, it's like it's like getting pulled over, and instead of getting a ticket, getting a warning. I mean, you know, it's grace. Don't do it again, because now you know what you did wrong. So now walk in that truth. You see. And there has to be a, a full distribution of both, you know. And when you're walking in grace, it doesn't mean that you dumb down your unconsciousness to make it more, more digestible. You know, grace doesn't really need to do that, you know. And truth isn't about isolating people, you know, um, from a creator or from those who are are owned and designed and walking in a way with that creator. It's, it's not about isolating, you know. Um, it's about bringing people together under one path, under one idea, so they can actually finally, you know, get something done. You know, but a lot of times, like I spoke about in the blood family segment, people feel that level of condemnation when truth is around them. And, you know, the truth is, like, when it comes to... Um, when it comes to truth and condemnation, you know, there was never, there was, the truth shouldn't naturally condemn you. It could convict you, you know, but even condemnation, if you look at any like spiritual system, the only time, the only time that a prophet or a messenger condemns people, they only condemn graceless Religious people. And you can do do the science on that. Do the knowledge on it. You're going to see that. 
those without those without grace, the Pharisees who are constantly seeking to condemn, condemn. Those are the people who who get condemned by the prophets and the messengers who come along. You know, uh, and those are people people the ten percenters who typically will use truth to control people, to implant fear, to implant guilt, to implant doubt, to condemn them. You see, but. You know, if you're really trying to do any type of real work or substantial work, you have to create a model of, of an experience that is all true, is all grace. And obviously, um, grace can be easier to institute than truth. That's obvious because, you know, well, people, pe people want a little bit more than that a lot of times. But um, thematically, you need both of them. You know, um, if you're really going to like face the suffering and the destructiveness that becomes a burden of people's wayward life, wayward lifestyles, man. And, you know, um, you look at an individual like Jim Standrick and finding like, listen, y'all, y'all need to hear like this because we're family and I'm over here slaving away for you. Me and like me and Connie, <laughs> you know, we're over here slaving away for you guys. And like he said, I'm important. You over here sleeping. So, uh, I'm important. You see, that's self-knowledge because all, all environments need a, need a shepherd. You see, th there's nothing wrong with that. And there's a lot of work that's going, and, and they're representing something. And they're holding themselves to a standard, a standard that you might not even understand. And like I said, a lot of times when problems come, people will hold, as soon as leadership speaks out, they hold them to, oh, to see, they, you know, you shouldn't condemn a congregation like that. You shouldn't come out of your face like that. But you do it all the time, constantly. Constantly. But as soon as he says something, now all of a sudden you're holier than thou and you want to start citing all the things that he's supposed to do and not supposed to do. Though he's, you know, 365 days in the year, 364, he's been doing the right thing. One day out of 364, he finally, from his frustration, says something. Now all hell and fury has to come down. Meanwhile, you've been doing this for 365 days out of the year. But because you didn't have the courage to, to climb up those steps, you see how the podium and those altars, you got to climb up steps. You got to climb. You got to achieve something. You got to get up there. Because you didn't have the courage to climb and make yourself a target in front of thousands of people, maybe even millions of people. You didn't have the courage to do that. But somehow in your mind, you think you're made of the same thing as the person who does. You're not. You're just not. Sorry. You know, and a lot of times there's a there's a painful openness that leaders, whether they be pastors, bishops, Ianifa, Babalao, Awo, Akomfo, you know, um, all different priests and shamans and gurus. There's a painful openness that they have to develop and a tolerance, and even a creativity when you're working with people. But at the same time, you are becoming increasingly, increasingly vulnerable to being overwhelmed with, with, with the, the feelings of inadequacy, the responsibility of another person, um, the responsibility of a person's feelings, uh, the despair, the isolation. You become totally open to all of that. And sometimes it tears you up. It tears you up. You see. But you, it's, it's a balancing act because you have to open yourself up to listen and, and to hear and to not, you know, condemn a person, but to bring objective truth. But while you're opening up, you also open yourself up for all of those other very rough things to deal with. And the people you're working with, whether it be your congregation or your godchildren or your students, whatever, they skip off. They walk off like, yeah, that was so good. You know, I feel so much better, yada, yada, yada. Whew, I unburdened myself. And now it's on you. And some stuff you can sidestep, but most stuff you can't, you see. So when you're carrying all of that, and then you got to bring it home to your family, and you got to figure out ways to get it out of you and, and things like that, that's, a part, that's what comes along with the job. See, people think leadership is about being the boss. <laughs> Not so much, because half the time people don't listen with, the, unless you're in a military 
outfit. People don't listen anyway. <laughs> They'll call, like, people call, hey, chief, chief, chief. People say that all the time. Chief, chief, you're my teacher. Do you really treat me like your chief and teacher? Because as soon as you get upset, let's see if you speak to me like you would someone you respect as a chief and teacher. Let's see if that's, that's what happens. You see? So it's not really so much about being the boss as much as it is about being accountable. Because again, as soon as something goes wrong, you're the one who gets the blame, right? If someone is upset, you're the one they dump on, you know, and you have to be accountable for your actions in a way that's so magnified that a lot of times you can't speak out. So this individual going off for, for literally was five minutes. Now, he ser he's been servicing this congregation for 24 years. I'm sure his segments at minimal are at least 30 minutes to one hour every single Sunday. And that's if he only does one sermon per Sunday. That's not including the counseling that pastors have to do, the weddings that they have to do, the christenings that they have to do, the burials that they have to do, you know, the prayer services, the visits to the hospital. All that stuff goes in there. Five minutes he, he checks his conversation like an, like an older man is supposed to. It goes viral. It's all over the Internet. It's on the news. CNN covered it. Everybody was on it. Five minutes. <laughs> and he wasn't saying anything wrong. He said, yeah, you, you know, you dancing all in the videos. You know what I'm saying? Come to death row. No, he didn't say that. But I'm saying, <laughs> you know, he's, he's just... Um, you know, he, he, he's saying everything that is correct and that's needed to be said. But again, a lot of times it, it's the sad religious perception that people have of, of leaders that kind of make sometimes hard, like decision making, very messy inside of a large environment. You know, sometimes people don't understand how messy that can be to make a decision inside of those type of environments. But, you know, I, I had read this um. It was either a book or article some years back. And it was a very interesting thing that was said in there that I always liked, I always remembered. Um, you know, but it, it said that um, it was talking about the, um, the, uh, the um, just the, the representation and the idea of like spiritual leadership and the, and the, and the um, iconograph, iconography of, of it, you know, of what it looks like in, um, what it can just kind of like um, express itself as, and they were using a bird. So, you know, in many instances, even when you look at like, this is a little decoding for you, you look at a lot of religious images and things like that sometimes, especially in the Catholic Church, you see the eagle, right? And the reason being is because the eagle represents the messenger. That's why they, they use the messenger. The, the eagle oversees things, but also has the ability to call you know, many energies to attention. Um, but it, the eagle was always considered to be, as far as animal spirit, a messenger, right? So the eagle is a representation of Yahweh. Or I'm sorry, excuse me, of, of Yahuwah. And also, and again, a, a representation of Yahshua. So it, that's the idea there of that eagle. So there was this thing said that I always liked, and it said, um, oh, what was it? I'm trying to remember. I know they were talking about the, the eagle... You know, uh, but they would say, oh, they were saying people expect clergy to have the grace of a swan and to be as friendly of a, as a sparrow, to have the strength of an eagle and to have the night hours of an owl. And then those same people expect such a bird to live on the food of a canary. All right. So that was always like I remember when I when I first kind of read that, and I'm paraphrasing it, but that was, you know, it. But I first read it, it was like, wow, that, that hit the nail on the head. That's it right there, you know. Um, you know, just grace of the swan. You just got to be so graceful and just accept so much. Uh, the friendliness of a sparrow, you know, always a smile and a hug and the strength of an ego. You could take anything and stay up all night working, the night hours of an owl, but then you're supposed to... The, the feed on a, the food of a canary, you know? And again, like, once you even, you see the, the work that a leader does, man, being that chief operator, if you will, and a lot of times, you know, you're 
you're washing dishes one minute, you know, um, you're, you're fundraising next minute, you know, you, you have everybody's secrets swirling around in your heart and in your head, you know, um, you're heading up the boards and, and stuff like that. You're, you're overseeing everything, you know, um, the, the annual dance or banquet you have to direct and organize. Yeah. I mean, just, you know, it just gets into so many things and, and, you know, that idea of that ego is so, is so clear there because the ego carries your prayers and your affirmations back and forth, you know, and, um, the ego is always in search of spiritual truth, you know? So it's like that perfect modeling, if you will, of leadership or of a, of a chief or of an overseer or of a pastor, that idea of the ego. And, and, you know, like I said, we're just in a time now where, um, we have to understand that leaders, yeah, they are getting frustrated. And some of that frustration is because they haven't switched up their own rhythm and their own agenda. Um, I can tell you right now, for our new, we're not about waking anybody up. You want to sleep in the church? You're going to sleep, sleep. You're behind there. You know what I mean? Um, everyone can be asleep. Everyone can just keep dancing within their dreams of darkness at this point. Um, this is not the season and the dispensation to be walking around trying to wake people up. That's why it doesn't work. Because you notice everybody who's waking up now is waking up to nonsense, fake leaders. You know, the fake conscious cats. I don't want to use words like the Hotepians and stuff because that's so disrespectful to the term. But, you know, these these fake conscious cats who running around and, and they're getting all of this play on secular platforms because they're not talking about anything. You see, everything is an Illuminati conspiracy. You know what I mean? It's just worthless information. How many of these leaders that you see, whether you see them, whether they're Muslim, whether they're Hebrew, whether they're just pro-black, whether they're shouting Ifa and Arisha, how many of them are telling you to get up in the mountains, get out of the cities, get land, become self-sustaining, store gold? You know, store store your finances in places that, you know, can withstand or in currencies that can withstand shocks. You know, how many of them are actually giving you real practical information? And how many are just talking real fast, real, real fast about nothing? <laughs> At the end of the day, after you after you listen to all of that, what do you have to tangibly move on? Within the next five minutes, what can you move on next in the next five minutes after you hear all of that? So, like, I'm going to give you something. Who's calling me? Man, don't be freaking calling me. Anyway, um, um, huh. okay, but um, anyway, so like I was saying, um, that call threw me off. <laughs> You know, who's giving you something tangible? So I'm going to give you something tangible right now. Don't try to wake your family and friends up anymore. It's over. It's not going to work anymore. Everybody who's sleep right now wants to be sleep. Stop wasting your time. You're making a fool out of yourself. Do not wake anyone up. I repeat, do not wake anyone up. I repeat, do not wake anyone up. There's hardly any new souls being born on the planet. Remember in the Matrix when he woke up Neo and he's like, usually you don't wake up people past the age of eight. You know how old the people are on the planet right now? New souls ain't coming through. That's why nothing new is being invented. Everything is being recycled at this point. We might have some technology. But remember, all technology is, is already based off of nature. So even the technology isn't really, they're not really breakthroughs. They're just figuring out how to do what they envisioned doing before or what they saw in temporary reliefs, you know, that were put up thousands of years ago. They just figured out how the ancients did it. But my point is that new things are not being brought forth. And the reason being is because new people are not coming onto the planet. Everybody that's coming back is old souls. They're old. We keep talking about how old these, these young people, they look so old, it's the chemicals in the food. No, it's because they're old. <laughs> so don't try to wake them up. People are coming back clear on either they're going to be, you know, awakened or they're going to stay asleep. And there's a lot of didactic learning that's happening right now. They don't need you to wake them up. They need you to cultivate their awakening. As they stand perpendicular to the, to the square, they need you to help cultivate that. So you need to be talking to people 
or I advise you to speak to people who are on the path. Don't try to wake people up because it's such a beautiful distraction from you doing what you're supposed to do. And it makes you feel better because you might know a couple more things than that person does. And now you can make them your whole distraction hobby. Yeah, I'm trying to talk to my nieces and nephews, my nieces and nephews. <laughs> trying to wake them up. Stop. Just stop it. We're not in that dispensation anymore. I don't care about waking anybody up. I used to. I used to do that. Especially when I was in the Piscean age, when we were in the Piscean age, with the age of belief, where you could stir up a person's emotions to revolution. You could, you could, you could emote somebody into consciousness. We're not there anymore. That's why we don't even have that level of charisma. So those of you, those of you still feeding off of these, these preachy teachers, they just come around like preachers collecting the plate, fundraising and all that stuff. You, you're in the wrong age. We're in the age of the knower now. The knower is the light. The light is already in your eyes. The sun is up. This is, we're in the age of the daytime. The Piscean era, that was the water. Right now, we're moving through that fire energy, through that sun energy, which is the unchanging energy where it, it changes everything that it touches, but it is never changed within itself. So based on that, we are what we want to be now. We're doing what we want to do. Don't keep falling for people blaming stuff on, on things that happened six, seven hundred years. Yeah, you know, we still got that slavery imprint. I don't already told you about that one already. I don't want to hear about any, any other disgruntled and evil and wicked acting Negro females who have this imprint from slavery from when the men couldn't protect us. Because like I said, that imprint was also you cleaning house and cooking meals every day. So how you just how you skip over that one, but you just kept the angry part. Knock it off. It's BS. It's always been BS. Okay? So that's the truth I'm going to give you right now so you can save yourself some time and energy. And like I said, with Thai New, we only want the special ones. Those are the ones who are awake. And they were awake since they were young, 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 young. When people ask them, like, how did you start getting into this? They can't even remember. I don't know. I kind of always was. That's, that's them. That's us. Come on. Come on over. That's us. We got a seat for you. <laughs> the other ones, they're in a dream and they're enjoying it. They're enjoying their sleep. Stop trying to wake them up out of their sleep. It might turn around and hurt you. All right? So... This has been the Chief You Yacht bo- uh, Broadcast. I was, gonna say, I was about to say broadcast. Podcast slash broadcast. And uh, I trust that you have something now that you can utilize to um, move a little bit more sensibly on this safari that we call the human experience. And, um, you know, keep conjoining yourself to that creator source and spark and energy that will bring you back to uh, your place of origins, but as a much more evolved being, okay? We are the prototypes. It's us. We're the prototypes. So we're supposed to maintain our cleanliness and our design and our, and our artful sovereignty so that way we can model that for everyone else. All right. This is Chief Yuya signing off from Anu Life Global Ministries. Anything you want to know is in the description below. Anything you want to know is in the description below. Think about that before you hop into the inbox. I promise you, probably the link that you're looking for is already there. All right, everyone. Enjoy uh, the rest of your Sabbath.